Great, thanks very much. So I'm very happy to be here and talk about this paper on behalf of uh, my student, Sharifa, who could not be here, but is actually on the beam over there, so you can wave at her. Uh, and my colleagues in information science, Francois and Phoebe. Um, so there's been a growing amount of really great work in HCI that's looking at how to construct feminist HCI, how to design tools that combat sexual harassment, and how to study the inclusion and participation of women more broadly. And the goal in our work initially was, how do we take some of this knowledge and apply it to the case of rural women in Bangladesh? Uh, we were specifically looking at rural Bangladesh because Sharifa is actually from this particular area and she was really driven to try and have a positive impact on the lives of these women. So we set out to follow common HCI, HCI for D best practices, uh, conducting an ethnographic study in which we sought to understand the context of these women's lives and discover opportunities in which design or technology might be able to have a positive impact. And at a high level, and I'll talk more about this a little bit later, we discovered that the challenges and the problems that these women face are so great that the idea of the typical HCI intervention of the kind that we usually discuss uh, really just became quite absurd. But at the same time, we didn't want to just give up and walk away. And the question of how to move forward constructively then really became the main contribution of this paper. And so today I'll talk about some of those challenges, uh, a few of them, not all of them. There are more in the paper than I'll talk about right now. Um, some of the challenges that they face, the role of technology within this context and within these women's lives. Uh, I'll then discuss why some of our common HCI approaches that one might take uh, are not going to fit well with this particular population or context. And then I'll introduce a framework and some of our initial ideas for what to do instead and how to think about uh, designing in these complex and fraught spaces. Um, it's really important to note, and I want to be very, very clear, that we do not solve any design problem in this project, in this paper. Uh, instead, we're really trying to expand the HCI community's understanding of how to think about design within deeply patriarchal societies. So our ethnographic study was done in a part of Bangladesh called Jessore. Uh, we recruited participants with the help of a local NGO, the Rural Reconstruction Foundation. Um, and we used ethnographic methods, a combination of observations, semi-structured interviews, and focus groups. Uh, we interacted with a total of 90 women across all of these methods. Most of the women participated in both an interview and a focus group because we got different kinds of data out of those different uh, settings. Um, we used thematic analysis to then analyze this data and construct the themes that I'll talk about today. Our participants were from 12 different villages. For the most part, they were living in extreme poverty and had very low levels of education. This is the demographic data for the interview participants, which is what we collected. And you can see that fully half of the women we spoke with had no formal schooling at all. Most of them were homemakers, rural farmers. Um, some of them tried to make handicrafts and sell them for additional income. Uh, and all of them were married or at some point had been married. Um, okay, so what are some of the challenges that we uncovered? And if you've worked or lived in deeply patriarchal societies, some of these will probably sound familiar. Um, many of these women described facing discrimination at all stages of their life, pretty much from birth. Boys get better food, they get more opportunities. We definitely found that the education of girls is not a priority, as our demographic data shows. But interestingly, we discovered that this was aggravated by sexual harassment that occurs. And in particular, we had one person describe, at school, a group of boys targeted my daughter. They used to stand in front of her school's gate. They used to make comments about her. We chose to stop her school. Finally, we found a husband for her. Now she can study if her husband wants her to. And so in this case, what we see is that as to combat sexual harassment, parents and families are choosing to stop educating their daughters and instead seek to find a husband and marry their daughters off. Uh, and in fact, we did find that girls in our sample got married at a very young age. The median age of marriage was actually 14. 
After marriage, we also found that all of the decision making is done by males. Um, because these families are living in extreme poverty, this interaction of poverty and lack of control causes extreme stress and anxiety for these women because they're living in poverty but really have no uh, way to try and help their own situation or lift themselves out of that without the permission or uh, input from the males in their family. Um, so this was, this was uh, something. And in fact, Sharifa had many uh, instances where our participants would ask her to try and find economic or employment opportunities for their children um, because she was someone who they perceived could, could help them. We also discovered that domestic violence is extremely common. Um, although we did not officially or, or formally ask about domestic violence, over half of our interview participants volunteered that they uh, suffered domestic violence at the hands of their husbands and in-laws. And in addition to this, perhaps different to Western contexts, it's very socially unacceptable to complain about this. It's much more part of the family life, and so complaining or reporting it uh, just doesn't happen. Um, and even though most of these villages have a dedicated police officer that is supposed to be taking these kinds of reports. Um, so to describe our participants' reaction to the idea of reporting it, one told us, if someone comes to rescue me, I'm saved for a small time, but it does not end there. He will release his anger on me anyhow, maybe double next time, and I do not know when. I choose to be beaten for a few minutes rather than worry about that. We asked about how the women currently use technology and how technology might play a role in their lives, uh, discovering that many of them actually don't use technology at all. Um, they don't know how to use technology. They've never really done it. There were a lot of people who were afraid of touching technology. They might break the device. But perhaps a little bit deeper, we found that technology artifacts were really gendered male within these societies. And this led to not only the women not using them, but not wanting to use them. As an example, one participant told us, many of us are not interested to carry or use something that women do not usually use. Rather, the males should use them. I don't want to be laughed at in the neighborhood. With this in mind, we also then asked about the idea of designing new things specifically for women that might specifically target their needs. Um, and we discovered that there was huge concern about how new designs or artifacts might fit in with their daily lives. So as these pictures show, most of the women are very busy all day doing housework, cooking, taking care of the children. They're incredibly busy. And there was concern that the introduction of any new thing might disrupt this and get them into trouble. So one of them told us, if you give me a new artifact, I might spend my whole day with it, stop doing mundane household work, do not cook or clean the house. It is going to be trouble. If my husband does not find meals on time, he will be very angry. And if he realizes that it is because of that artifact, he will no longer allow it at home. We also discovered that there was a lot of skepticism that technology would be able to play any kind of positive role, uh, rightly so, and especially when thinking about complex social problems like domestic violence. So one of them said, if my husband beats me, I'm sad after that. If you design for me and my sadness, it won't help. It does not matter much if there's some artifact to cheer me up. If my husband is again dissatisfied with me, he will beat me again, and no device can help me at that point. So as HCI researchers, and in light of these ethnographic findings, the question that we really wrestled with for months was, where do we go from here? What is the right thing to try and do at this point? As a reminder, our original goal was to try and understand the context and discover opportunities for design to have a positive impact. So we might think about some of the approaches that prior HCI researchers have done. Uh, in particular, there have been a cluster of really cool interventions to try and counteract sexual harassment. But in this case, we note that these might actually backfire and cause more harm to the women. So you might imagine that if you have some sort of intervention that might have a girl alert her family or her, her parents when she's experiencing sexual harassment, this could just lead to them being more concerned about the sexual harassment and actually finding her a husband even earlier in her life. Similarly, there have been some work to try and look at how to combat domestic violence. 
And in these cases, they're not going to work because the violence is not socially, uh, it's not socially acceptable to report it. For many of our participants, it wasn't even considered to be abnormal. This is just part of the society and part of what women uh, are expected to put up with. And then finally, there's been a lot of cool work to try and empower women by delivering information services or additional communication channels. But in these cases, we see that the women don't only not use technology, but there's no desire. They don't want to use technology. And so our conclusion was really that there are no simple technology interventions that we could design or deploy to solve any of these problems. And so you might say, okay, well, they don't use technology now, but why don't we teach them to use technology and then we can design interventions? And this kind of idea really leads into our next point, which is this clash of values. The values of us as liberal feminist researchers uh, who want to promote an agenda of gender equality against the patriarchal values of the communities and perhaps most importantly against the actual values of the women themselves. Uh, we discovered that they were just not interested in a cultural revolution in which we tried to make women equal to men. They were much more interested in things that might make their lives and their mundane household chores a little bit more bearable. And so thinking about these clashes, we really find ourselves with two possible directions. The first is to ignore our own values and just design for our users' needs, so user-centered design. And one might imagine that in this case, setting aside ethical and moral objections, we might find that the best thing to do is to design a new matchmaking algorithm that would help families more efficiently find husbands for their daughters. The other direction is to instead impose our own Western liberal values on these women and fight for gender equality on their behalf, even though it's not what they're calling for. And in this, we're very much reminded of uh, past ideas of colonial domination in which people go in, are horrified by the situation, and attempt to fix things uh, in ways that are actually indefensible. So both of these directions are not tenable. They're not what we want to be doing. Um, and so then the question becomes, how do we move forward? What do we do? And so we propose this idea of designing within the patriarchy even if we ultimately wish to subvert it. Uh, and we provide three ideas that I'll talk about uh, in turn. The first is to empower within existing societal structures that include these patriarchal structures instead of trying to fight against it. And this would require us to set aside our objections or our uh, qualms that we have about the current situation and make peace with the experiences of these women as we find them try and work within the constraints of domestic violence or discrimination, um, recognize that husbands or in-laws are going to have to approve of everything that the women do, every artifact or design or, or practice that we try and introduce for these women have to be approved by their husbands or their in-laws. And we note that there's definitely an opportunity to try and channel uh, some of our ideas or work through locally valued advocates. As this quote suggests, one woman told us, if somebody that we do not know comes and gives us a new technology, my husband and in-laws will not allow me to receive it. But if it is given by doctors or NGO people that we can trust, then it is fine, as long as they're able to convince my family about the purpose of the technology and how it's going to benefit us. And so we really think that trying to work with these locally trusted, locally valued advocates and within the existing societal structure provides at least one initial foothold for trying to move forward. The next idea is to shift our focus from focusing on the problems that these women are facing and to instead try and support the tactics that they're already using to cope with their own situation and make their lives more bearable. Uh, and in doing this, we note just as one example, and there are more in the paper, that there's an opportunity to really try and focus on how women already communicate and lean on their key allies. And in this case, one of their strongest allies are their amity groups, the female groups within the family, including daughters-in-law, aunts, uh, female elders, 
and to try and use those communication channels that women already use to find some measure of comfort and see if we can strengthen that bond and provide them with additional support uh, through these existing uh, channels that they already use. And broadening this idea a little bit, we charted out all of the different stakeholders that we encountered in these women's lives. And I know that it's a complicated diagram, so stick with me for a second. So in this uh, particular figure, the width of the arrow uh, indicates the frequency with which interactions happen. So um, you can see that a thick arrow happens between the women and the husband or the women and the children, and that indicates that there's a frequent uh, interaction. The length of the arrow gives a sense of intimacy, so how close to the women these particular stakeholders are. Dotted arrows are really not very frequently used relationships. And then the gray arc so indicates relationships that are heavily controlled or mediated by uh, the husbands. And so in doing this, you can kind of see that the thick arrows that are not covered by the arc are channels through which we might start to think about how we could support women. The very last idea uh, is to broaden our conception of who the users are and design beyond the users. And this very much echoes ideas in participatory design. Um, and in this idea, we would design for those around the women. Um, so instead of designing for the women themselves, you might imagine that something that helps the men do better with the family finances might end up having a positive impact on the women's lives, even though we're not focusing on the women directly. And lastly, we're not arguing to set aside our own ideals of gender equality permanently, only to recognize that long-term change in these kind of situations requires decades of work, uh, thinking of movements like the civil rights movement or suffragette, where these kinds of change just take decades. And so hopefully what I've done today is really just provide us with some initial footholds into how we can think about design within these kinds of societies uh, and move forward as an HCI community to try and continue to work with these women. Thank you. All right. I'm going to let the next speaker seeker set up. One question. Hello, yeah, Janet Reed from the UK. Um, we recently did some work in India, and I, you know this is great work. I'm trying to get a hold of because it's the same question I have in my own work: is where do you go next, and, so, so, and how do you explain to the people in Bangladesh what the aims of the overall? So you know, does it take 20, 30 years? Maybe you can just give me some hint as to where, yeah, where it goes. Sure. I mean, I think the question uh, is a little bit, where do you go next in terms of, of, you know, I think there's a whole spectrum of short term and long term. Uh, where do you go next in terms of when will we have gender equality in Bangladesh? I think probably, yes, decades. Um, where do we go next in terms of being able to try and work within women's existing social structures and figure out new ways to help them uh, even in small but ways that actually make an impact on their lives. I think there are many opportunities to do that now. Um, I do not advocate simply designing an app and doing it that way. Um, but certainly there are opportunities for communication between some of the people on the ground to be strengthened uh, and to educate the community more broadly about you know, the need to educate children or the benefits of educating their children. So I think there's a lot of things we can do there, but it kind of depends where you're, where you're focusing on yeah. this. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This was uh, a best paper award, so I want to congratulate Nikki and her colleagues on that.